Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I am Magda Hinojosa. I'm the director of the School of Politics and Global Studies here at ASU. And I am very pleased to be introducing William Simmons uh, to you today. He is the professor of gender and women's studies and director of the online human rights practice graduate program at the University of Arizona. His research is extraordinarily interdisciplinary. It uses theoretical, legal, and empirical approaches to advance human rights for marginalized populations in countries across the globe. His books include Joyful Human Rights, published by Penn in 2019, Human Rights Law and the Marginalized Other from Cambridge University Press in 2011, and Anarchy and Justice, an Introduction to Emmanuel Levinas's Political Thought from Lexicon in 20, 2003. Professor Simmons has also served as a consultant on human rights and social justice issues in the Gambia, Nigeria, China, Bangladesh, Mexico, and the United States. As you can see from the slide, we are going to hear him speak about the aftermath of the Rohingya genocide. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Simmons. Uh, is this working? Oh, it's working. Um, <laughs> thank you, Magda. Um, thank you to the uh, sponsors of the event, especially the Rosenbluth, Rosenbluth uh, Family Charitable Foundation, uh, the organizers of the event, Vanker, uh, John, and all the staff who have just done a wonderful job uh, welcoming me back to ASU. I was here uh, from 2002 to 2012, and now I'm at U of A. Uh, I'd also like to thank, um, you know, all the uh, speakers who've come before me. I have learned so much. Um, I blame you for the migraines I have, you know, thinking about all these issues. And, and it's like, I'm, I need to go to the bookstore and get another notebook because I've taken so many notes. Um, I'll say, um, uh, Magda mentioned, um, this isn't a great joke, but it's a joke. Um, Magda mentioned my book, Human Rights Law and the Marginalized Other with Cambridge University Press. And right when they were about ready to print it, I emailed the editor and I said, oh, it's not human rights law and the marginalized other, it's human rights law and the marginalized otter. And apparently Cambridge editors don't like jokes. Um, he did not see that as funny at all. So, um, so today I'm gonna talk about um, the aftermath of the growing genocide. Uh, let's see. Just uh, go down on this. Hmm. Oh, that's weird. It is uh, play mode. Okay. Oh, I think we're good. Oh, oh did I? No, no, you're good. I shouldn't have made that joke about Cambridge, sorry. Remember Cambridge Analytics? <laughs> okay, um, and so I, I have a lot of slides uh, to talk about the Rohingya situation. Uh, I might skip through a few if I feel like I'm going a little long, but I, I, I'm gonna go through three things. Um, and so the takeaways for this presentation is, first of all, the terrible treatment that the Rohingya have faced over the last 40 or 50 years, um, and give you a sense of their culture, kind of situ their socio-political situation. I'm going to talk about the International Criminal Court and the case that involves the Rohingya. Um, and the lesson there is that the case involving the Rohingya is incredibly innovative and it expands the jurisdiction of the ICC. 
And so I think it's going to have huge impact on other possible cases, uh, and especially uh, dealing with India. Um, and then I'm going to talk about resilience and post-traumatic growth among the Rohingya. And I'm going to talk about um, a project I'm involved in, in the refugee camps, doing art projects with Rohingya adolescents. Uh, I want to end on a note of hope. Um, I did write a book on joy in human rights, and I do like to talk about the positive side of human rights, but I'm going to end with a wicked problem, which is that if we work to empower the Rohingya, but their structural, chain, structural system doesn't change, then what are we setting them up for? In other words, if they start demanding their rights, in a situation where their rights are not going to be respected and their demands for rights are going to be lead to increased persecution, should we really be helping to empower them to claim their rights? I apologize because what you're seeing on this screen is not what I'm seeing on this screen. Uh, so a background, if you don't know much about the Rohingya, uh, they are from the far um, northwestern part of Myanmar. Uh, you can see they're from what's called Rakhine State. It comes up against Bangladesh. This is Bangladesh here, going back up here. Um, the Rohingya um, are the, in the Rakhine State is the poorest state in Myanmar. It is also the most climate susceptible state. Uh, it is on the Bay of Bengal. It's a place where cyclones routinely um, are created. Uh, it's also a place with heavy monsoons, landslides, and other problems. Um, <clears throat> and so in 2017, a genocide happened in Rakhine State, and the Rohingya fled to the Cox's Bazaar region of Bangladesh. And you see also on this map that this is a in very important geopolitical area with China, India, and Southeast Asia all surrounding this. Um, this is a hotly contested area that uh, China has a lot of interest in, and so does India. Um, <clears throat> in 2017, uh, in August 25th, we saw the uh, what's called, what uh, was an ethnic cleansing started. Uh, the US government 10 days ago, finally labeled it a genocide. Uh, it only took them five years to make that decision. Um, overall, um, it was a short-lived genocide, in, in, at least directly. Uh, 10 to 25,000 people were killed. We still don't know. There was widespread sexual violence. Villages were burned to the ground. Uh, one of the unique features of this genocide was that thousands of people were were thrown into the fires of their villages burning or in central fires in their villages. Um, you can see this is a village in uh, central Rakhine state and the two satellite images show you exactly, this is what ethnic cleansing looks like. There was a village there and now there's not. Um, 700,000 people fled to Bangladesh in a matter of months. Um, <laughs> And you can see, I mean, these are people who didn't have much, but they took only what they could carry. Uh, they were harassed by the Myanmar military. Some people were killed on the journey. Uh, they fled across the Naf River. Um, and you can imagine the chaos of 700,000 people very quickly showing up in, um, in Bangladesh, in the poorest area of Bangladesh, where about 200,000 Rohingya had, were already living there. But quickly, the UN and other agencies had to create um, a makeshift refugee camp for 700,000 people. The Bangladeshi government quickly decided they were not going to let the, Bangla the Rohingya move further into the country. They were not going to put them with families. They were going to create a camp where the Rohingya were going to stay. So they weren't, there was no chance of assimilation. Uh, into Bangladeshi society, and that created the world's largest refugee camp. There's now approximately 1 million people living in this, uh, it's this chain of about 34 camps. Um, and basically the land had to be cleared in a matter of weeks. 
uh, shelter had to be created, sanitation had to be provided. Uh, the first few weeks of this was absolute chaos. Um, the stories I've heard about the first few weeks are really horrendous. Uh, the, the camps are a um, ecological disaster. Uh, hillsides have been, had to be, you know, cleared. Um, uh, the surrounding area was cleared to provide firewood um, and to provide shelter. Um, and we quickly saw landslides. We quickly saw all kinds of issues. Elephants, there was an elephant uh, trail that went through right where the middle of the camp was. And the elephants didn't really care that there were people there. And so um, about 20 people died being trampled by elephants in the first months of the camp. Uh, fire is a constant danger. Uh, and we can talk about why, but um, uh, hundreds of buildings uh, just in the last few weeks have been destroyed, making people further homeless. So in the camps, the situation is not great. Uh, I mean, the UN and other agencies, this is their first code red uh, refugee uh, event, all hands on deck from the UN from around the world. Anybody who could provide something was shipped to Bangladesh, uh, DFID, the British Development Agency, the USAID, everybody came together and remarkable what they did in a matter of months, okay? But you still have a million people in refugee camps. Right, who are stateless from Bangladesh and now are state or stateless in Myanmar and now are stateless in Bangladesh. Uh, most Rohingya are not allowed to have jobs. Uh, they're not permitted outside the camps, uh, especially recently. The, the um, movement outside the camp has been is, has been really curtailed. Um, there's overcrowding, poor sanitation. Although what the UN has done very quickly is really incredible. Uh, no formal education. Uh, so you have half the population is under 18 and there's no formal education. And so for four years, we've had 500,000 people who should be in school who really haven't been in school. Um, so basically the camps have made the stateless people even more stateless. They are not registered as Bangladeshis. They, are, they still don't have Myanmar uh, identification cards. Okay. Now, so this is what happened in 2017. Before 2017, the Rohingya were already considered the most persecuted minority anywhere around the globe. Um, you know, that was just a common trope we'd hear in human rights circles is, you know, the Rohingya are the most persecuted minority. Um, for years, there's been intercommunal violence between the Buddhists, okay, between the Buddhists um, in the area in Rakhine State and um, the mostly Muslim Rohingya also, there's been violence by the Myanmar military against, against the Rohingya, okay? And so these, this has flared up over time. At times, over 100,000 people would flee into Bangladesh before this in 2017. So there was already a lot of chaos, a lot of violence that people had gone through. In 1982, a law was passed which stripped them of citizenship in Myanmar. And so they haven't had any identification cards uh, official identification cards since then. And if you don't have an identification card, you can't get social services, you can't vote, you can't run for office, et cetera, et cetera. Um, childbirths are still not registered uh, for the Rohingya. And so you can't get into real schools, things like that. Uh, literacy rates are really poor. There's, it's the um, poorest area, the most remote area of Myanmar, and that's saying something. And then you have cyclones every once in a while, including some major ones like Jiri, uh, which was a direct hit on Rakhine State uh, in 2010. Um, in response to this, the Rohingya have rose up occasionally and have formed defense organizations. And in 2012, the most recent version of this, ARSA, was created. It was actually created by Rohingya um, uh, people in a diaspora in Saudi Arabia, but it had influence in Myanmar. Okay. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about, okay, that's the situation. Now I wanna talk about the International Criminal Court and they have made uh, strides on the Rohingya situation, which have impacts on uh, other situations around the globe. Uh, the World Court has also weighed in on the Rohingya situation. So there's two different international law 
uh, processes going on at the same time. Okay, the International Criminal Court, as you all know, is a criminal court. It is to try individuals for four major categories of crimes, crimes against humanity, war of aggression, uh, war crimes, and genocide. Now that's not a problem in this situation, right? You know, many of the panels before me were talking about the problems of intent in the genocide convention. There is no problem with that. Okay, you, if you look at the Facebook post before what happened in 2017, it was clear they were trying to exterminate a population. They were trying to get away, get rid of Rohingya culture. They were trying to get rid of Rohingya people. They were trying to get them to either be killed or to flee into uh, Bangladesh. Okay, so uh, that is not a problem. The criminal court, um, uh, you can see what it's done. It started off slow. It's, it's now uh, actively uh, looking into about 10 different cases, uh, including the Afghanistan case, but also uh, the Darfur case started yesterday, the day before, something like that. Um, but these are the countries that are part of the uh, International Criminal Court. And you'll see in Asia, the red is countries who are not part of the International Criminal Court. And so the only two countries in this region that are, are Bangladesh and Cambodia. Okay, so India is not, Myanmar is not. And so you would look at this, and it's funny because I'm still seeing my first slide on this um, uh, so, so when um, in 2018, the special prosecutor for the International Criminal Court, she's the one who initiates investigations. She's the one who decides who gets to be brought up on charges. Uh, she's somebody named Fatou Bensouda, or she was um, uh, the special prosecutor back then. I actually know her because I do work in the Gambia and she was a Gambian attorney before she became world famous. And so uh, Fatou Bensouda, announced in 2018, she wanted to do an investigation to lead to a case against Myanmar in the International Criminal Court. And we're like, okay, now hold on. <laughs> You're a very smart woman, but how are you going to do that? Because Myanmar never ratified the International Criminal Court statute, the Rome statute. So you can't bring a case against them. They have never agreed to the jurisdiction of the court. And so, um, Special Prosecutor Ben Suda said, well, actually, I think I have an idea here. And I'm gonna do it focused on the crime of deportation, which is part of the, um, uh, the, the statute under crimes against humanity. So mass de deportation that is widespread and systematic counts as a crime against humanity. And we're like, yeah, exactly, yeah, I agree with that. But my problem is, Myanmar is still not part of this treaty. They never agreed to this. And she said, but the crime of deportation involves two countries, the sending country and the receiving country. And you're like, okay, well, that's true. But, and she's like, so if you didn't have a country to send the people to, there would be no deportation. There'd be no crime against humanity. So she said, I'm going to bring a case I'm going to go to the, the pre-trial chamber and I'm going to argue that, that the, um, because deportation is happening in one country that has ratified the Rome statute, I can bring a case against them. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. And a bunch of NGOs and a bunch of lawyers chimed in and they filed briefs in support or against her arguments. And the, the pre-trial chamber said, not only do we agree with what you said, but you didn't go far enough. They said, okay, deportation involves two countries, so we can bring a case against Myanmar individuals for this, what, what happened under, uh, for a crime against humanity. But they also said, there's other logics you might wanna play with. What about if there's crimes that led to deportation? Right? What about the widespread sexual violence? People fled because of that. What about the persecution and people fled? So it's so basically underlying crimes to deportation. And she's like, okay, I can bring those cases too. 
And then they said, you know, but there's another logic here too. If deportation involves two countries, you know, while the Rohingya were fleeing, there were people who were shot who ended up dying in Bangladesh. Like, okay. And so murder, which is under the crimes against humanity, could maybe be brought if you have the evidence for it. And then she said, and the, the great thing about this, she said, sexu- he, they, they said sexual violence is something that continues after the perpetration of the act. The trauma continues after the act. And so if the trauma, the displacement, the ostracism from the community happens in Bangladesh, you might be able to bring a case against people in Myanmar. Like, okay, <laughs> that's pretty wild. But it's this, the, I think, I, I argue this, the International Criminal Court finally saying we are gonna be a progressive instrument for human rights law, that we are going to look at the progressive development of human rights law. We are going to believe these four crimes that we have jurisdiction over are what we call use cogens norms. They apply to anybody anywhere around the world, right? And so if we can find ways to expand our jurisdiction, we will do that. Okay. Now that's pretty wild. And so I think this is a radical decision by the International Criminal Court. The country I think is most fearful of this should be India, because India has been persecuting the Rohingya minorities there. They also have been persecuting Muslims there. And many of those people have been fleeing into Western Bangladesh. And so a case could probably be brought against India, even though they are not part of the Rome Statute, which underlies the International Criminal Court. Okay. So since then, well, uh, there's been two fact-finding missions from the UN. The UN has gotten really good at fact-finding missions, and they have interviewed thousands of Rohingya in the refugee camps. They haven't been able to officially go into Myanmar, but they have, you know, gathered evidence in Myanmar. And what is really cool for me is I was doing a certificate course with um, a university in Bangladesh. We were doing an online certificate course for 35 activists, uh, practitioners, professors, students from like 10 different countries. Most of them though were from Bangladesh and several of them were Rohingya. And so it was a 12 week, 12 week long course, four hours a night, um, you know, one day a week. And it was at 2 a.m. my time. So I was up every Saturday from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m talking to the most amazing activists, mostly from South Asia, including Rohingya. And so I said, well, for this, this module, why don't I do a moot court where, the, where everybody gets to pretend they're bringing evidence to the ICC to bring charges against somebody. And I often talk when I talk about human rights law that sometimes it's not the decision that's important, which often doesn't get implemented, but it's the fact that you have an audience that you're able to say, you can tell your story. You can say, I was wronged, right? And so I broke them up into groups and to see the Rohingya as as well as the Bangladeshis from that area do this moot court. And the passion that they had was incredible. And they had no problem saying who they thought they had, who they thought was responsible, who should be brought up on criminal charges under what statute of the Rome statute under how this fit with the logic. And they came up with the following, right? They, they thought the military leadership, which is not that unusual. We had huge debates whether Aung San Suu Kyi, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, should be brought up on charges. And most people, especially the Rohingya, said yes. She's never been an, she's, you know, a, she, democracy in Myanmar, but never for the Rohingya. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, so I'll, I'll tell more stories about Cambridge. Um, they wanted to bring up the Buddhist militias in, um, in Rakhine State. Uh, this guy, Arshan uh is one of the most militant Buddhist monks. And he was all over Facebook in 2012, saying from 2012 to 2017, saying these people need to be kicked out. These people need to be exterminated. 
And then they said, we want Facebook brought up on charges. Because Facebook, we can't understand this, but Facebook is really was the face of the internet in Myanmar, right? People didn't log on to Google Chrome. They logged on to Facebook. It was like the portal. And Facebook said, we don't have anybody who speaks the languages in Myanmar, so we can't really police this. And so if you think that the hate that, was, that happened in the U.S., you know, over the last four or five years on, on social media, think of it as being completely unrestrained. And in a country that really believes in national identity over everything, and as many of you have talked about, like Professor Alvarez has talked about, right, that where the Jews were considered the germ that had to be removed, they were the ones who were impure. This is the same situation, but now imagine having the power of Facebook. And it's the, the app you go to on your mobile phone, right? And so that hatred spread throughout Rakhine State. And so right now there's a lawsuit filed in U.S. courts against Facebook for what for this, for the Rohingya genocide, okay? And, and the Rohingya are actually asking for $150 billion, okay? But the students all believe that these people should be brought up on charges. They passionately argued for why they, why they should, why they could use that logic under the International Criminal Court. It was really cool to see it. It was like confirmation that this is really important to the victims. I'm gonna go from that to a project that I'm doing in the camps with Rohingya adolescents. And remember 50% of the Rohingya are under age of 18 in the camps. This is, we start, first of all, I'm gonna talk about resilience, and post-traumatic growth. In other words, how do people deal with, in a good way, after incredible trauma? Well, the Rohingya have what we call polyvictimization, which is multiple victimizations. And usually when you have polyvictimization, it, 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 the literature shows that multiple victimizations aren't additive, like, oh, I was victimized by this person and this person, that equals two it actually is multiplicative or exponential. So if people have been victimized by a whole group of people, it, it, it basically their trauma is compounded, right? And so people we find here in the US, we did a study uh, with migrant women um, here in, in Arizona, and we found people who just were completely overwhelmed by their trauma. And they just could not, there was just no success stories oftentimes, okay. Well, the Rohingya, since at least World War II, have been traumatized. They have been traumatized um, in all kinds of ways in Myanmar. But then we have to realize those first few months in the camps were incredibly traumatizing for them. It was, you know, Thomas Hobbes kind of war of all against all. It was a pretty ugly situation. There's traumas within the refugee camps. Right now, people are not allowed to uh, move around. Uh, people uh, just in the last, uh, we'll talk about this in a few minutes, uh, just in the last few weeks, about 3,000 Rohingya shops have been bulldozed, right? Their, their means to make a living have been taken away. We have gender-based violence in the camps. We have all kinds of things. Of course, it's worse for women and girls. This is a highly patriarchal society. And then it's worse for people with disabilities, LGBT, LGBTQ folks, and religious minorities. You note that I didn't say the Rohingya are Muslims. They're mostly Muslims. There's also a Rohingya Hindu population and a Rohingya Christian population. And they have suffered at the hands of the Rohingya Muslims, right? So it's a very complicated issue. So uh, the recent study that was done, um, a uh, survey of Rohingya adolescents in the camp, 50% reported they'd been close to death, 40% reported they'd been in a combat situation or had been tortured, and of course, that leads to high rates of severe depression. So we are trying to, uh, to theorize when resilience can happen, when post-traumatic growth can happen, and when does P PTSD happen, okay? And so <clears throat> resilience means to bounce back, 
That's what its etymology means, okay? To snap back into place, right? And I argue in a previous work that if somebody has gone through severe trauma and then you tell them, ah, you just have to keep going, you know, get back to your old self, that's an injustice to the trauma. It's an injustice to what you've gone through, right? And I'm sure many of us have gone through very severe trauma and your life's forever changed. I'm not gonna continue with graduate school after that, right? My dream of being this is not gonna happen because of this, right? And so resilience, you know, etymolog etymologically kind of makes sense for some people, but usually when it's kind of a minor trauma, I can snap back to what I was doing. But a major trauma, it's really hard to do. Now, what we find is that when you have a really major trauma, uh, you succumb to the trauma. Okay. And this is for Holocaust scholars, this is what the survivor syndrome was that psychiatrists came up with in the late 40s and early 50s. You know, people who were basically Muslim on after the camps, right? People in uh, mental institutions in Israel just could not function after what they saw. Okay. Some people are able to survive with impairment. This is what we would call PTSD. Some people are able to snap back, continue. But what we found, and, and Dr. Bershkailo yesterday, such a great person on this, you know, he survived six concentration camps in Bosnia, and you saw who he was, right? He's a living example of post-traumatic growth. He's a better person. He's got a better worldview. He would admit it. And he works with people who do that, that after immense trauma, some people, and he gave the statistic of 60%, actually have more positive sequelae than they have negative sequelae, right? Because after a major trauma, you rethink your life. You rethink of who you are. You rethink about your connections with society. You rethink your connection to God and to spirituality. And all of a sudden, certain things aren't as important, right? We don't, you know, you know, who won the Packers game is not quite as important anymore, although it's hugely important. Don't get me wrong. Um, um, and so we wanted to find out, you know, what's going to happen with the Rohingya. And a friend of mine, Bulbul Siddiqui, has just written a paper called The Myth of Repatriation. We always talk about repatriating the Rohingya. That's just not going to happen. Unless something major happens in Myanmar, it's just not going to happen. The Rohingya, this is a, a, a what well, was a village. It is now a transit facility, which is basically a concentration camp. And so if the people wanted to go back to Myanmar and go to their home village, it's not there anymore. It's a camp. And so those people would be moved to, you know, not very pleasant. The, the Myanmar military is not going to give them citizenship, is not going to give them their rights. And you may know that there was a coup in 2021. Um, and there's a, a resistance movement to that coup against the military. It's called the National Unity Government. Uh, it's made up of a lot of people who are in the old government who were the ones who persecuted the Rohingya, right? So the Rohingya have very little faith in the National Unity Government. And in fact, many members of the National Unity Government, the government in exile basically, have said the Rohingya are not... Burmese. They're not from Myanmar. So the hope of them being repatriated, it's, 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 it's a myth, I think. And it, I assume they will be in Bangladesh. The average stay in a refugee camp is 15 to 19 years, anywhere around the world. So these ideas of people who are in Chad going back to, to, um, uh, to Somalia. How am I getting this wrong? Chad going back to Darfur or South Sudanese going from Uganda or Kenya back to South Sudan, you know, the chances are very slim. The Rohingya also are not accepted in any country in the region. Okay? And we could add to this cartoon India as well. The Rohingya um, who do make it to these other countries are second or third class citizens. Um, in Saudi Arabia, they have jobs jobs because they work almost as slave labor. Okay. 
So here we are in the middle of this, resilience is not possible. They're not gonna continue their trajectory. And so our question is, is it possible to have post-traumatic growth? Well, post-traumatic growth is, is if, when you find new relationships, you understand your life in a better way or different way, you uh, change your um, uh, spiritual and existential life, things like this. And often as uh, somebody was saying uh, yesterday, it happens through meaning-making exercises where you have control of writing or doing artwork and you can imagine a new future for yourself, right? And so instead of, you know, in trauma, you are no longer in control of your life, but we can work with youth in this case to help them see a new possibility for their lives. And that often has to be done through artwork. And so a colleague of mine went to the camps in 2018 and 2019. And um, artwork by the children is the universal currency in the camps. Uh, remember, these are uh, informal education settings. You cannot teach in Bangla, the language of Bangladesh, because if you do that, they might assimilate into Bangladeshi culture and try to get jobs in Bangladesh. So we're not going to do that. And these are kids who've gone through an immense amount of trauma. You know, they can't really enunciate that. They can't vocalize their trauma. And so uh, many of the teachers have said, well, what we're, we're going to do is just do artwork. We're going to focus on, you know, draw, you know, what your journey was, draw uh, these kinds of things. Um, you'll notice in the music corner, uh, somebody put um, the lyrics to We Shall Overcome. Okay. And when I was there, um, Many of the kids knew the first verse to We Shall Overcome. They didn't know the other verses. And so for about an hour, I taught them the other verses to We Shall Overcome. And by the end, we were singing it extremely loudly enough so that the village, the, the leaders from that community came in and like, what's going on here? And me and the kids had a blast. We, we had a great time singing We Shall Overcome. Okay, but the, you know, the someday. And the question is, when is that? So we went back in 2020, uh, we got a grant from the National Geographic Society. We wanted to do a pilot test to see how much artwork we could do, how the kids responded to prompts. Uh, for those who do research like this, we had to figure out how can we get permission from the parents? You know, will, will we be able to get permission from the parents? Can we track them down? All of that was a yes. It all worked really well. Um, I did participatory video exercises, if you, any of you know that. Uh, we did participatory drawing, participatory mapping. It was really a lot of fun. Um, and these are kids just holding up uh, a drawing of their life in Myanmar and then their life in Bangladesh, comparing the two. Okay. Well, while, while there, I met a guy who was the country director for this NGO called Art Illusion, which I had never heard of. But now I'm best friends with them. Uh, in fact, this morning I had a long conversation with them and I'm working with them in, in Bangladesh, but also in South Sudan. So it's like, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, but Art Illusion is, is uh, led by Max Frieder. Uh, he's just got his PhD from Columbia, doing participatory murals and participatory art projects with kids, mostly refugee kids around the world. Okay. And so he, all those things I was saying about art and meaning making, you know, we were doing it at a small scale. He does it in four different refugee contexts around the world. And he, he his NGO has just gone through the roof just in the last few months because uh, it's just amazing. And you can see the, the effects on the kids. You can see the incredible murals. And I love this picture. Um, working with Rohingya adolescent women is, or girls is pretty tough because they're often not allowed out of their compound. You can see the amazing murals they did. And, and all of these are symbols to the Rohingya culture. And so he's trying to revive the Rohingya culture. Um, when he first went to the camps, he was asked, he, he basically said, I want to work with Rohingya artists and have them work with kids. And almost everybody said, there is no such thing as a Rohingya artist. He's like, no, it has to be Rohingya artists. And so he eventually found some Rohingya artists, some of whom said, I used to be an artist, but I haven't been for 20 years. I gave it up. And so he's been training them to work with the kids, which helps with the language barrier, I have to say. 
and you can see, and some of these he, he's done with um, uh, the host communities too, the Bangladeshis who live nearby. This is a uh, article he wrote. I love the title. I created art with refugee kids in Bangladesh and saw them transform into superheroes. And so basically he was walking around the camps with some, Bang with some Rohingyas and he, they noticed scraps of cloth. And so they picked them up, put them in a bag and it's like, okay, we got to do some artwork with the scraps of cloth because this is just you know garbage on the side. So he had a big bag of cloth and he opened it up with the kids and then they just start throwing it around, which led them to cheering and dancing and laughing. And then the, the adults came in and was like, what's going on? And all of a sudden the adults were <laughs> cheering, laughing and dancing. And he said, the feeling was contagious. Local men and women joined in with the children, began dancing and jumping and throwing the fabric scraps up in the air, covering themselves in the material. The fabric felt like it represented all the hidden emotion these children and adults had that needed to be let out. And then the act of changing one's being and identity in something magical helped the kids let down their guard. Okay, the power of artwork among traumatized kids. So we have formed a research team with some faculty from a university in Bangladesh, uh, faculty and students from our human rights program, and then our Rohingya artists and Art Illusion. And we are developing, uh, our part is to develop the monitoring and evaluation of this to show that this is having a positive impact on the kids, especially post-traumatic growth and resilience. Okay. And so what's post-traumatic growth look like in the Rohingya context? These are some ideas we've come up with in, in conversation with the Rohingya, that they will, instead of being persecuted and having no pride in who they are as Rohingya, they'll develop a pride that they are Rohingya, and they will love the Rohingya culture. They'll have a sense of community. They'll demand human rights. They will um, uh, imagine new possibilities outside of Myanmar that we don't have to go back, that we can you know, go out into the larger world. Uh, uh, you can see the others as well. And so we're busy creating scales to measure all these things. And instead of showing you this, the very boring scales, I wanna show you some Rohingya culture. And if you would have asked me, you know, if, if you would have looked up in 2017, in which I did, I Googled Rohingya culture. There was almost no sources on that. Okay, it's very hard to find. There were books from like the 1950s, uh, but not much recently. And this is a Rohingya photographer who said, um, and the, his, his English is his fourth language, so you'll have to forgive that. But he, basically he's saying that if we can show our culture to other people and we represent our culture, nobody will ever misunderstand what our culture is. We need to take control of our culture. And he hopes that my photos will bring life into perspective for you all. And so on Facebook, you can follow a number of Rohingya photographers. And the work is just amazing. Now, if I was doing this, this would be considered voyeuristic. Uh, but th this is them showing their lives. There's now now a rebirth of all the traditional cultural forms. Uh, making boat models is a big, uh, big activity. A lot of woodcraft among Rohingya. Music, of course, plays a major role. There's traditional instruments. And now we're seeing books on Rohingya folk tales, Rohingya children's stories. You can go on YouTube and you can look up some amazing um, digital images and digital stories that NGOs have helped the Rohingya kids make of their traditional stories. And so for the first time, the Rohingya culture is being cataloged, it is being uh, distributed, uh, and the Rohingya in most parts are leading this effort themselves. And the uh, IOM, the International Organization for Migration, now has a virtual uh, Rohingya uh, Cultural Heritage Center, uh, and they're building one uh, that is, is, is uh, uh, place-based. And then some of the university professors I'm working with are doing the same thing. And there's now a Facebook page a Rohingya friend of mine has created called Rohingya Demand, okay, which is amazing. 
In 2019, though, several of the Rohingya leaders uh, decided to have a get together to honor the second year of the genocide. And um, about almost 100,000 people showed up. And um, I've always, this is not my favorite picture of this because it looks like they are furious in the front and that they're, but then again, they deserve to be furious and we don't need to have just peaceful victims all the time, right? You know, some people deserve to be angry. Um, but after that, that caught the Bangladeshi government off guard. And so anybody who was in charge of the camps at that point was fired or reassigned. The um, 41 NGOs were said to be involved in organizing this. They weren't, but they were kicked out of the camps and they still are not allowed back in the refugee camps. So their, their work is all stopped. The Bangladeshi government went in and took people's SIM cards. So they could not communicate back to Myanmar. They could not communicate within the camps. And they actually uh, stopped uh, the internet in the camps for a couple of years. Uh, it's now getting a little better. They also started that barbed wire we saw in the first pictures and the Bangladeshi government deemed them a security threat. Okay. So the idea is that post-traumatic growth was allowed up to a point. And then the Bangladeshis see them as a threat. Just in the last couple of months, things have gotten worse. The 3,000 shops have been bulldozed, multiple fires in the camps, more educational facilities have been shut down. Freedom of movement is restricted. They now have checkpoints within the camp. And so people are not allowed to go from one part of the camp to another. And you have to remember the families are scattered throughout the camps, okay? And then uh, the Bangladeshi government has uh, taken over an island that's out in the Bay of Bengal. It's an island that didn't exist 25 years ago, but the silt coming out of a river created an island. And they decided this island called Basanchar was gonna be where they're gonna relocate up to 100,000 Rohingya, right? And the human rights organizations have fought against that because it's, it's susceptible to cyclones, et cetera. And it also moves them even further, right? It, it basically continues the process of ethnic cleansing. The stateless people become even more stateless if they're moved to Basan Char. And recently, if you go against the, um, the people who are overseeing the camps, your name gets added to the group that's gonna be moved to Basan Char. And so you have this control over dissent. So several Rohingya have decided they might want to take up arms. And, and after we did one of the sessions in Bangladesh, uh, in the refugee camps, we were doing a drawing session. Um, three boys, 12, 13, 12, 11 maybe, came over to me and kind of ushered me out of the little building we were in. And they, in their broken English, they said, we want to, we want to take up, we want weapons to go against the Myanmar military. And I was like, okay, you might not know what political science professors do. And, you know, at least in my country, we don't supply weapons. I'm sorry. You know, maybe we should, but, um, but then I, I, you know, I did what every American does, right? Every, <laughs> why don't you try peaceful means? You can have, you can use your voice for peaceful means. And so I'm thinking, okay, I'm, 400 miles from India, I'll bring up the example of Gandhi. They had never heard of Gandhi. They had never learned of Gandhi, right? They had never, there was no tradition of peaceful nonviolence there. And so I was like, okay, well, if you, your education is that bad that you've not heard of Gandhi and you're living in South Asia, I might take up arms with you, okay? And so you can see one of these is written by a Rohingya basically saying, <laughs> You know, all this stuff we talk about, about sanctions, et cetera, none of this is going to work, right? And there was a coup in Myanmar. You know, people have tried to take over the country uh, and there's a resistance to it. So they wanted to go back to Myanmar and join that resistance. Okay. And I'll end with this. The, one of the positives of this, and, and um, Giorgio Agamben, a uh, philosopher of the Holocaust, writes, about how the refugee perforates our knowledge of the world, right? The refugee 
Everything we assume about the world is undermined by the refugee. Now, Gaman's a little strong on that, but somebody who works with a Rohingya in China, who I know, she basically said the same thing. As the Rohingya construct and reconstruct their reality, they're gonna, they have a chance to reconstruct our reality and teach us something new. And I'll say that this idea that we need new perspectives, new answers to the world, looking to the refugees who have seen the underbelly of our society might be the place to look. And I wanna thank all kinds of people who I've been working with, uh, National Geographic Society, but the Rohingya partners, the students that I work with, uh, Max and Sousa from Art Illusion, and of course, uh, my faculty friends at North South University in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you. I see things like this, and I read about um, what's happening with the Uyghurs, and then I see the Middle East and the Muslim countries, and they talk about the Islamic Brotherhood, and, and yet they do nothing for, for the Muslims. Now, I, I, I appreciate the fact that the Rohingya are not completely Muslim, so let's, let's forget that for a moment. But by, by and large, the problem of them are. So you look at this and it, it just makes me think, uh, you know, the, this Islamic Brotherhood, Muslim Brotherhood is just a big myth. Uh, and, I, and having worked in, in the Middle East for 13 and a half years, I could see that, you know, the Saudis couldn't really care less about Palestinians, uh, despite what they said in the papers. But um, it just makes me still wonder why these countries who are doing fairly well economically, Saudi, you know, especially now, um, uh, you know, the UAE and such, and they do nothing for these people. They have a lot of money, and so what is there any comments that you have on that? That that these Islamic nations do nothing for these people. Yeah, um, interesting question, John. I mean, I, I think I mean the Muslim world is clearly not monolithic, right? And so I don't think we see Cambodian Christians. In, in the same way we might see Canadian Christians, right? Um, and so uh, Rohingya Muslims, um, you know, are not directly connected to people in the Middle East. Uh, you know, there's the African Muslim population, which is so large, the um, uh, Indonesia, et cetera. And so these are distinct populations and they're connected by religion, but also we have different shades of Islam as well, right? Uh, how it's practiced in West Africa and how it's practiced in the Middle East is so different. Um, so you have that going on, um, but you have to remember Bangladesh did allow in 700,000 people. Uh, and that was in part, in large part, because they were our Muslim brothers. Right. The prime minister was like, we have our Islamic brothers are in need. We have to open our country. And that was not a real popular position at the beginning, but she eventually convinced the Bangladeshis that we need to do that. Um, and they have housed 200, 300,000 Rohingya refugees for 30 years on and off. Right. So so there is some opening up of that, but it, it's not tied just to Islam. There is a there's one camp um, that there's one it's camp one in the camp system, which is a Hindu camp. It's where the Rohingya Hindus are kept. And it's the only one that is since the beginning has had a military presence around it. And that has been actually to, to protect the Rohingya Hindus from the Rohingya Muslims. So the Bangladeshi military has been doing that. And when we talked to the people in that camp, the Hindu leaders, they were like, at the beginning, India said they would come in and they would help us because we are fellow Hindu brothers. And since then, they haven't come back. And uh, we actually just had gone back to them. The, the Hindus said, we'd gone back to them because we need a place to do crem cremations in the traditional way. We don't have one in the camps. We sometimes, there's a small Hindu population 
in that area in Bangladesh. And so we, we borrow their cremation site. But we've asked India to just give us enough money to have this, our own, and they have not done it. And so uh, the only Hindus that come from India right now are people who are looking to traffic Rohingya Hindus. So I, I don't think it's an Islam thing. I think it's a, more of an apathy thing. It's more of a geopolitical thing. Yes, please. So I, I'm really, uh, I'm speaking out of ignorance here. I don't know the causes, what happened to the question. You should like on that. That's the first question. The second question has, uh, focuses on Ansasha Suji. I can never yeah. expect to get her name right. I still don't get her. There's something puzzling about this woman. Minimally, the world could have taken away her Nobel uh, Peace Prize. That, that, that's the minimum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are great questions. Um, uh, I'll start with Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, yeah, I mean, I was one of those who was protesting and, you know, doing all kinds of letter writing to get her freed when she was in house arrest. Um, but, but I think what we, um, we underestimated was that she was fighting for democracy because she thought that was the way to get a Buddhist nationalist country in Myanmar. And so she is a Myanmar nationalist first, a Buddhist nationalist second, and a Democrat or a human rights defender third. At least that's the way I see it. And so um, when it came, when she was, you know, she was actually the, one of the heads of the delegation to the world court defending Myanmar against claims against genocide. So she was there in the courtroom making arguments that this wasn't a genocide. This was something that we, we needed to do, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of course, now that there's, she's now back in prison and she's, um, um, you know, she's no longer part of that delegation. But both the resistance and the military have both sent their own delegations. And now the world court has to decide who is the delegation representing Myanmar. But... Um, as far as her Nobel Peace Prize, you know, I think it should be revoked. Um, she's lost many prizes that she had been given. Uh, but, you know, what, two years ago, the uh, leader of Ethiopia was given a Nobel Peace Prize, and he's now been the architect of the genocide in Tigray. So when people say to me, uh, Zelensky in Ukraine should be given a Nobel Peace Prize, I'm like, let's hold it with national leaders for a while. You know, I don't think we have a great record of that recently. Um, what happened in, well, in 2017, uh, the, the justification for the genocide was that ARSA actually attacked several police stations that were near the Rohingya area. The, so the Rohingya, so the ARSA, which uh, is a Rohingya nationalist movement, but it was really set up in Saudi Arabia. It had provided arms to people in, the, in, in um, uh, Myanmar, and they had had attacked military police stations in Rakhine State. And so that was the trigger, supposedly, like the Reichstag fly, fire and things like that, that is going to, okay, now is our turn. We can go in and, and wipe out the Rohingya. Yeah, no, there's a geopolitical answer to that, too. Um, um, Rakhine State is the link for a major part of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative from China. Okay, it goes right through Rakhine State. The largest oil and gas terminal is right in Rakhine State. It is going to go straight into um, across Myanmar and go into uh, southwest China in Kunming. And it's going to provide all the oil and gas for Kunming as the city that's going to grow you know, to, to 10, 15 million in, in a few years. And if they're able to have the gas and oil go through there, 
they don't have to go through um, the Malacca Straits, which is where is the biggest bottleneck in um, uh, world transport, basically. And so China would be able to uh, have their oil and gas much cheaper. It'd be a stable supply. They wouldn't have to worry about being blockaded, things like that. So China really needs Rakhine State to be pacified. And so the, Rohingya, the, the Buddhists said, well, this is a good way. You know, we need to please our Chinese overlords. Um, I shouldn't say that if it's recorded, sorry. Um, but we need to please the Chinese. And um, then there's other reasons. Another piece of this is that a law was passed in 2012, which took away all peasant land holdings in Myanmar. And it basically allowed land to be confiscated. And so if uh, a corporation wanted to take over large pieces of land, they could take them from peasants. And so that happened as well. And so it's a geopolitical, it's a land grab uh, to enrich the um, Myanmar military. And then it's also absolutely an othering going on as well. Yeah. As far as Buddhist nationalists, I get that all the time from my students who, you know, they think, oh, okay, oh, I was just at the Buddhist retreat, right? Well, there's Buddhist nationalists in Malaysia and in Cambodia and Thailand um, and in Myanmar. And, um, you know, some of the fiercest people are Buddhist nationalists, uh, you know, claiming to take up arms. Um, and so I would just say, you know, with my question, my answer to John is, you know, religions all seem to get connected to politics and that leads them to be connected to the military, including our little peaceful Buddhism that we practice here in the US. Any other questions? Yeah.